Hello, I'm Bruce Brockman and I'm going to share with you what I knew about Linux, what I learned about Linux, and some of the good things and some of the bad things. This is for a presentation for the NEOPC, Northeast Ohio PC Users Club group on November the 12th, 2014. Linux. And I've uh, entitled this presentation, The Confessions and Consternations, plural, of a Linux newbie. And newbie to the extent I played with it about 10 years ago and decided that uh, Windows was a better option for me at that point. Uh, but always have uh, kept up with Linux a little bit. Not nearly enough, I've learned, but a little bit. And when I say consternation, I mean strong feelings of surprise or sudden disappointment that causes confusion. Yes. So, uh, the big three. Whose operating system does not belong on this page? And we're talking about the biggest, the best, the greatest. Not that guy. Not that guy. But... Linus Torvalds. He wrote uh, the first version of Linux in 1991. Today, 95% of the world's 500 fastest supercomputers run Linux. All the top 44 fastest are running Linux. Worldwide today, Linux on PCs is 1.61%, not very many, but it's, uh, it's growing. Smartphones, 79.3% of the smartphones, and that's growing also, in the world are running some form of a Linux operating system. Servers, where all the information is stored, out on the cloud and uh, in companies and at the government and uh, so on. Wherever information is stored, the servers are running Linux, 60% of them. And it's used in routers and smart TVs and CD, DVD, Blu-ray players and automobiles in many different ways in automobiles. NASA, the Russian military has their own version of a Linux operating system and so on. As well as uh, many of the major computer manufacturers offer a Linux-based computer in their line. And why? Why is Linux uh, used so much and grown so well and all that? Uh, two main reasons. First one is it's free. <laughs> free is always good. Uh, most of it is distributed under a general public license. And uh, because there are so many different versions of it, you have a lot of, uh, and we'll call them eggheads at this point, uh, no disrespect met, and that's for sure. But there are a lot of people that uh, get their kicks in uh, working on these things, and if you have a problem, they're more than happy to work on your particular problem. So uh, that's one of the reasons that this thing is growing so much uh, free. When you're selling something commercial and you can get free parts for it, it makes sense. And uh, from a user standpoint, if uh, there's a whole community of very bright people out there that want to help you, uh, try calling Microsoft. Okay, so really the uh, reason that this presentation was put together is... Uh, Back when Microsoft announced that XP would no longer be supported by them, uh, after doing some brief reading, I decided uh, to tell the club that uh, it was a good idea for members that had old XP machines to move to Linux. And uh, this is a Google search I did, uh, XP to Linux, and you'll see it got 60 million hits. So. There are a lot of people writing about it, talking about it, thinking about it, doing it, and so on, and I thought it was a good idea at the time. Um, probably is. Or maybe it isn't. That's that consternation again. 
As this presentation goes on, you're going to see that there's a little red star up in the upper left-hand corner. And when we get to a page like that, you're going to see a screenshot of a web page. And that red star means that a link to that page will be available uh, on the NEOPC forum uh, in the Linux presentation. There are going to be about 35 links here in this presentation. So, uh, again, as you uh, look at this video and if you see something that you're interested in or that you want to know more about, if there's a little uh, red asterisk up in the corner, that means that you can uh, look up the link to that particular item. First one is uh, XP Home Users Should Upgrade to Linux, Not Windows 8.1. Well, that actually is pretty obvious because machines that run 8.1 need a lot more horsepower than machines that run XP. But there are an awful lot of people that uh, have an old XP machine that uh, still can get an awful lot of use and uh, without a lot of expense. In most cases, virtually none. So, uh, this one says why Linux Mint is a worthwhile Windows XP replacement. Yep although it depends and we'll talk a little more about that. And this one says how to upgrade from Windows XP to Ubuntu. Uh, cheapest way to upgrade from XP. Ubuntu is uh, the largest, although Mint is growing on it, uh, version or distribution of Linux. Uh, there are updates and new versions of this brought out all the time. They support these things for years and the updates are free and in a lot of cases they're automatic. Uh, they aren't trying to sell you a new version like Windows 9 that never happened or 10 or uh, the new Animal for Mac. Uh, it's just when they've got some new neat stuff put together and they've answered some more questions and added some more things they just uh, make a new copy an upgradable copy available okay Windows XP support ends today and that was back in April uh, here's how to switch to Linux and here's a whole article on that this is a, a nice little website how to geek uh, extremely well done all right, distro, you'll hear that uh, term talked about when they talk about Linux, and that means it's a distribution, which means it's a uh, version. And uh, there are lots of versions of Linux based on what you want to do with your computer. So that begs the question, which one should I choose for my computer? And there's a list of things that you should think about before you choose a particular version, a particular distribution of Linux. How old is your computer? What CPU are you running? And we'll talk about that a little more uh, further on. Basically, you really do need to know whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit, and there will be a link here to help you with that. How much RAM do you have? And that's a really good question because I'm going to show you a version that runs out of RAM. It doesn't even get installed in your computer. It just runs on uh, on the RAM in your system. And you need at least 256 to run that particular thing, that particular distribution. Uh, if you don't have 256 gigs of RAM, uh, if it's a great computer and you can upgrade it, do that. Other than that, it's probably time to trade it in. Uh, not going to be much help. Do you like new things? And uh, if you're a Windows person, it's quite a bit of new things. If you're a Mac person, it's some new things. Are you going to have two operating systems? And Linux installs fairly quickly uh, alongside your Windows if you want it to. Uh, I'll show you uh, my presentation computer, uh, this little old eight-year-old netbook, uh, is running two operating systems. Are you running short on storage space? And Linux, when you're running a live CD or off of a USB, you can store on that. Uh, you don't even have to have a hard drive. 
do you want to spend time learning? And there is going to be a learning curve, and depends on what you want to do, and could be a little bit, and could be more than that. What do you want to do with this computer? And that uh, ties right in. You know, if you're just going to uh, go on the net and uh, do some email and write a couple letters, uh, fine. Uh, you can use a very small, easy to use distribution. And if you want to do other things, then you use something a little more complex. How much peripheral, peripheral equipment do I have? Easy for you to say. Uh, and we're talking about printers and cameras and a variety of things that you attach to your computer through the USB ports. That used to be a lot more of a problem than it is today for Linux. And what are your basic computer skills and what do you want them to be? If you don't want them to be any more than they are today uh, and you're willing to spend just a little bit of time resurrecting that old computer uh, you can do that or if you want if you've got a, a new shiny new computer and you want to add a second operating system to it to uh, do some unique things uh, questions you have to answer before you figure out which distribution of Linux you're going to want to run this is uh, as I mentioned and here's that little star so there's a link to this this page in Wikipedia uh, if you scroll down the page, we'll tell you which processors are 32-bit and which ones are 64-bit. Uh, 1970 from 85 back was 16, 85 to 03 was 32, and 64 since then is the basic on that. But again, you can scroll down here and you can learn whether your particular CPU is uh, 32 or 64. When in doubt, run the 32. Okay, so, revive your old PC, the three best Linux systems for old computers, and a good article, again, How to Geek. Another article, six cool Linux distributions to review on your old PC and laptops. And again, just somebody else's thoughts on uh, which ones to use on uh, old machines. Now this one is about the best distributions for new users, easier to deal with, which in some cases coincides with the other thoughts. This one is uh, the best ones, the best desktop. And a desktop is uh, what you see uh, on your desktop, and they're talking about ones that look an awful lot like what you're using today, whether it be uh, Windows or Mac. The seven best current ones for 2014. And this one, uh, 10 most popular Linux distributions compared, and, and this article goes in side by side and compares the pluses and minuses of uh, probably one of the 10 that you would choose if you're going to choose one. But uh, my choice has been for a really old computer. This one runs out of RAM. It's an extremely small uh, system. The ISO file is uh, 130 meg, all of which gets loaded into your RAM, and it runs uh, fairly nice. And uh, it's pretty popular obviously this was a Google search for Linux puppy and there were almost three million hits for that so it's uh, it's a good one and I'm going to show you and talk about it a little more as we go on so let's talk a little more about puppy this is their main web page and this is where you can find uh, the download for it and Puppy is a, a little different than most of the distributions, uh, and it's because it's so small. Uh, you have to run originally from a CD, uh, and then you can put it on a USB flash drive. So you need a live 
CD, and a live CD means that it can actually run the operating system. Your computer can run from that CD. Uh, once you're running Puppy, then you can insert a thumb drive, a USB thumb drive, and put Puppy on the thumb drive. Uh, and basically that's where you store, uh, whether it be your email or uh, things that you create or videos that you want to keep or whatever it is that you want to store. Uh, you can then store it on the thumb drive as well as you could store it on the uh, CD, DVD if you so choose. Uh, up to you. Most of them uh, you can uh, basically put the Linux distribution on a thumb drive and we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation uh, and start running the uh, Linux distribution from the thumb drive. In, uh, in this case Puppy Linux, you need to run it the first time from a CD, and I'm going to have some CDs available for those of you that are adventurous and would like to try this uh, later on. Very extensive website, uh, very active group that would be more than willing to uh, answer your, any questions you might have. Uh, I'm really quite impressed with with Puppy. For as small as it is, it, it runs extremely well. And because it's running out of your RAM, it runs much faster than having to retrieve the information from a hard drive. So, uh, homepage for Puppy. And when you load it up, this is what your desktop looks like. It also barks at you twice when it, when it opens, which is kind of cute. Anyhow, it, uh, it's semi-familiar to most of you as far as uh, there's a taskbar down here and uh, this is uh, your audio volume uh, this one is your connection internet connection this one actually shows a battery status uh, this is your firewall and this one shows the amount of storage available uh, I was running that off of uh, a very small thumb drive when I took these screenshots, so that's why it's showing red. Typically that would be all be green as you move up. That means you have a lot of storage. Uh, start menu type button here and that will pop up some things. Uh, files, this is like your Windows Explorer. Uh, help, and we all know what that is. Uh, if you're used to running a Mac machine, you'll know why you see a version of a hard drive up there. Uh, some pretty normal things up here. This is uh, a program installed, pre-installed for writing. Uh, very similar to Word. This uh, is very similar to Excel. Uh, you have a painting program and a drawing program. You have a uh, email program. Browser, uh, when you click on that, it gives you a choice of what browser you want to get, and you can go out and uh, get it, and it will install it for you. Uh, calendar, playing music and videos, uh, pretty normal stuff that you would see. These are more familiar to those of you that uh, run Mac, Apple. Uh, this is the dreaded console. A console is uh, a DOS window, and that's where you can put in changes to the program. Uh, scares most people, and uh, with most of these distributions anymore, you don't have to do anything with it. You can, uh, if, if there's something unique that you want to do, and you typically can find instructions on the Internet, uh, very explicit line by line instructions but again you don't have to uh, have to use it that's what scares most people about using Linux is having to do some uh, programming if you will this is just a close-up of uh, the icons that are up on the desktop uh, like I say the names are familiar perhaps the icons aren't but the names are familiar to most of you most of the names anyhow. So, uh, one of the things is Puppy Package Manager. And a package is a program. Uh, 
that's like what you see as an executable program, an EXE. And uh, when you open up the Puppy Package Manager, these are programs, packages, that were designed specifically for Puppy. And you can see over here that uh, as you click on these buttons, these programs for the desktop, programs for the system, uh, utility programs, file system, graphics programs, documents, business, personal network, so on, so on, so on, so on. Down here it shows you what programs have been installed that I've actually put on here. Uh, see this bottom one, Python. I was trying to figure out how to get uh, Dropbox on here so I could uh, share files with my other computers. And because Puppy is so uh, so small and skinny, it didn't have uh, a programming language. We'll call Python a programming language uh, as part of its system, and I had to install that in order for Dropbox to work with uh, work with Puppy. But there are a lot of programs available um, if you're just going to. Uh, not get into serious work and try and make a living with your computer puppy is probably the right choice to get started on at least. Uh, I think it's a, a great little operating system. And again, when you push the uh, menu button, you'll see some things that are familiar, some that aren't perhaps, but uh, they have pop-off things. Uh, all of these were created with this Pup Snap screen capture program. That's where all of these came from on that old eight-year-old netbook. Uh, and again, you have fun, which would be games, and multimedia, which would be uh, your video players and so on. Uh, help and shut down things that you're familiar with. So this is uh, the browser that I chose in Puppy, and it's actually it's called Google Iron, which is Chrome, uh, and it's a very secure version of Chrome. But when you install it, you can sign into your uh, Google account, which I did here, and uh, everything is available to you, just like you would be running it uh, on any computer. This is the uh, built-in email program, and I uh, went ahead and put my uh, one of my email accounts on here and it works just fine uh, very similar to Thunderbird but it will work with uh, virtually uh, any of the uh, email suppliers that are out there and then I decided I wanted to put KeePass on it well obviously I didn't think KeePass was going to be one of the programs that were built into it but uh, you can, through the use of a program called Wine, and I will uh, talk more in depth about Wine later, but Wine is an interface that allows Linux programs to run Windows programs. And easy enough, there is a KeePass Windows download you can get. And so if you install that with Wine, and you will see that uh, Wine is open down here, uh, so that's what I needed to open my key pass and uh, almost any computer I go to you'll see that uh, these are just some of my email accounts that I keep track of so I don't have all of the passwords memorized uh, so I needed a key pass so I'm going to show you why puppy is a little more difficult to deal with in regards to some of uh, the Windows EXE program. So if, if I want to run KeePass, I go to the File menu, and then I have to hit Control H to show the hidden files. And these are the hidden files. Then I go down to Wine and click on Wine. And then I know that Wine told me to install that on the C drive of this computer, which I did. So you click on that, and then you need to click on Program Files. And you'll see there's KeePass right here so you click on that and there is the exe for key pass and you click on that and lo and behold it opens up the key pass window you fill in your master password and it takes you right into key pass 
lots of little extra strokes here. Uh, the other distributions you can get a version of KeyPass that just installs and runs like you would normally run it in Windows or in Mac. So, the uh, next distribution we want to talk about is a program called Mint. Mint is uh, one of the most popular Linux distributions today, and it uh, probably acts more like a Windows program than any of the other programs out there. This particular version, uh, Linux Mint 17, came out uh, May 31st of this year, and uh, they say down here that they will support it until 2019, so five years. Uh, but in the meantime, they will be uh, updating it, uh, and new versions will again have five years. So. Uh, you'll be uh, working on Mint for the rest of your computer life if you want to for free uh, and up to date. So, uh, this program, Mint, was uh, installed on this same little netbook. Uh, this is a 32 bit version of it. Uh, and when you open up, and, and I uh, put it on from a live CD and then installed it onto the hard drive of this uh, little netbook. Had to uh, partition a drive and uh, format it into a uh, Linux format, which is not all that difficult. There are certainly step-by-step -step instructions uh, on the internet that uh, you'd be able to follow fairly easily. But it has a welcome screen, as does uh, Windows and uh, Apple and all those guys. And if you uh, click down here, it says show this screen and start up. Uh, if you uncheck that, uh, it won't show it anymore. But uh, first time you open it, here's what you see. New features, and if you're an old Mint user, then you want to see the new features. You don't really care because you've never seen it before. Important information, that's legal stuff. Uh, again, it's free, so there's not a whole lot of legal stuff. You just can't hold them responsible for anything you do, and you can't uh, you can't copy their work either. A user's guide in a PDF format, uh, automatic restore thing, uh, software manager. We'll talk about that in a second, and a chat room and forms and tutorials and on and on and on. Pretty pretty normal stuff. They ask for donations because, again, all this stuff is free and there's a lot of people spend a lot of their personal time on it and uh, this allows them to buy equipment to do testing and so forth. But anyhow, the uh, software manager is, is interesting. It would uh, bring up this particular window and on here, again, it's sorted by categories and uh, featured ones and internet and sound and video accessories like calculators and stuff and all kinds of games and office programs, graphics, system tools, fonts, science and education, programming. This one says all packages and these packages install directly into Mint uh, very quickly and uh, without using Wine as I had to in Puppy. Uh, so I did get KeyPass and I did get Dropbox without any additional things to download or fiddle with. Uh, all packages. There are 45,366 packages available for Linux Mint 17. Uh, I would hope that that would cover most everyone's needs. Uh, should be able to find anything you need there. Again, they have a uh, a menu button which will pop up and bring up things. Uh, here you'll see that's the uh, Firefox icon. Uh, here's for files, and here's your dreaded DOS little <laughs> terminal. Uh, over here, who signed in? This is showing we're on a wireless. Uh, that also used to be a problem with uh, Linux; uh, couldn't get connected to your uh, wireless networks and whatever. 
even my little eight-year-old netbook uh, just found the adapter in the computer and found the network without any problem at all. Uh, volume, uh, this one's showing the battery. There's my Dropbox, which opens automatically there, uh, time and so on. So uh, pretty, pretty familiar to those of you using Windows and even Apple. So, we've been talking about just two of the distributions, and there are many hundreds of distributions, different versions of Linux uh, that are for PC use. So, uh, if you go to, and again, this is Wikipedia, and there is a link to it, uh, Debian-based, and there are several different main versions of Linux and then they trunk off from there. Uh, as you can see there's some of that schematics of that. And some of the different versions and what they specialize in. In this top one, uh, 64 Studio is about video production. Uh, all different kinds. This goes on for pages and pages. Uh, read those first articles in the beginning of this presentation before you take a look at this you really unless you have a very specific need for something uh, you don't need to look here or you want to be entertained then you can look here try to use Linux without installing it and that certainly is my wholehearted recommendation do not install Linux until you're comfortable with running it and you are sure that that's what you want to do. Uh, so, you can make or purchase a live, and live means that you can run the operating system from it, either a CD, DVD, depending on the size of it. The puppy went on a CD without any problem at all and lots of room for storage. Uh, Mint is uh, 1.2, 1.3 gigs. Uh, installed, it's close to 3 gigs. Uh, on a DVD that uh, leaves you a couple gigs for storage uh, if you're going to leave it on the DVD, running it live off of the DVD. Or uh, you can put it on a flash drive and uh, you can get big flash drives these days for not a lot of money. So uh, you can run it any one of those ways. They, they also, all of the people, Mint and Puppy and whatever, you can buy a CD from them for ten bucks or so and uh, you don't have to make your own but we'll talk about making your own because it's a, a fairly easy process there's a link on the sites to those that uh, allow you to make a live CD including Puppy and Mint uh, with Puppy you don't need to know whether you're 32 or 64 bit it's just one uh, with Mint you have a choice between 32 and 64 bit uh, you download the ISO file and we'll tell you where to go from there now, uh, the thing that worries most people about doing uh, a live CD is having to get into the BIOS of the computer. And the BIOS is the interface between the hardware and the software in your computer. Um, and that's where you change the boot order. And if there is a problem with uh, computers today, and it doesn't matter whether it's Windows or Linux or whatever, boot problems are uh, an issue. But if you uh, follow the instructions and do the right thing, you shouldn't have any problem at all. Uh, in some cases, you're going to need to change the boot order if you're going to boot off of a USB thumb drive. Typically, the computers are uh, set from the factory to boot off of your CD first. If there's nothing in the CD, then they'll look at the hard drive. And depending on the uh, age and whatever, then they'll look at for a USB after that. But we're going to talk just a smidge about getting in there and changing that order yourself. Uh, I recommend that you do not make any changes until you have read the following. How to access the BIOS setup utility. This article is uh, pretty good and uh, goes into the basics of it. And uh, I've looked at it on several of my computers to do just that for uh, putting in Linux. And 
BIOS looks different on each one a little bit. So, a uh, good idea to read this article first. Uh, and this has only to do with BIOS. It has nothing to do with whether it's Windows 7 or XP or uh, Mac Tiger. It doesn't matter. Uh, it has to do with the BIOS that is in the computer. Who built it, what version, so on. Okay, here's a picture of, uh, and most computers, to get into the BIOS, and it'll say it on the splash screen. That's the screen that comes up before it goes to the window screen. And if you look at it closely, you'll see it says to enter BIOS press. And it's typically F2, F3, F12, delete. Uh, those are the major ones. But it'll tell you which one it is. Usually it's so fast, though, you'll miss it the first time. So uh, my strategy is I push all four of those keys at the same time when I start up the computer, and then I'll be able to see which one it's supposed to do. Anyhow, you'll open up the BIOS to uh, the main screen, uh, and you'll see a little tab up in the uh, upper left there that says Main. And everything here is... Uh, DOS based so you use the keyboard to get around your uh, mouse is not functional here uh, and you need to uh, use the arrow keys and the uh, function keys and plus or minus keys so we want to get over to uh, the boot options is where we want to go so that's this tab and uh, it tells you the order that it's going to boot and we're going to talk a little later about EFI, uh, which basically is hard disk. Uh, so this one is set up to boot from the hard disk first, second, which really is first, uh, then the CD, and then a removable, and then from LAN. So uh, what we need to do is we need to change the order uh, that they're going to boot in and, and they're going to consider in this case a uh, removable drive as a hard disk so uh, if you have you, you press on this and enter here it says uh, these are hard drives and this is a USB removable drive so we want to move that up to the first boot device and that's done by using the plus. In most cases, you have to uh, also press the space or uh, the shift key at the same time to move. In this case, we want to move the scan disk up to boot from that. So earlier I said we were going to talk about EFI, Extensible Firmware Interface obviously something that was designed by Intel. And the new computers running Windows 8 run UEFI, which is very different, and it was uh, put together by Microsoft and Intel. And you can't change the boot unless Microsoft tells you you can change the boot. Uh, they have to give special instructions and whatever. Now, there are a couple of the large distributions of Linux, uh, Ubuntu and Mint and so on, that have gotten permission from uh, Microsoft to use a code to allow it to boot uh, from their live CDs. Puppy won't do it. Uh, Try to put Puppy onto a Windows 8 computer and it laughed. Uh, this is a little worrisome. I, I, I'm concerned that uh, Intel and Microsoft have a little too much sway over uh, what can and can't be put on your computer. Uh, but that's for another session, I guess. So what I'm saying here is uh, if you have a newer computer and you want to try Linux on it, uh, Windows 8 in particular, uh, 
they have changed and it really is uh, different than BIOS now. It's UEFI rather than BIOS. Uh, we've had some people question whether you could put Linux on to uh, the newer computers. And the answer is yes. Uh, a little more difficulty in things and whatever. This article could explain it to you if you're uh, so interested. And there should be a little asterisk up here, and I forgot to put it up there. So there is a, a link to this if you want to read it. If you need some good reading material to fall asleep some evening, this is uh, perfect for you. Okay, we're back to uh, that little netbook, that little eight-year-old netbook. Uh, and I actually installed Linux Mint on it, uh, on the hard drive, and when you do that, uh, it sets up a what's called a grub bootloader. I don't know where they get all these names. Anyhow, it allows you, when you uh, turn the computer on, you get this particular screen, the grub screen, and it says, what do you want to do? Do you want to boot Linux or do you want to boot Microsoft uh, XP Home? Uh, and you use the arrow keys up and down to highlight uh, what operating system you want to uh, boot to. Uh, automatically installed. Getting it out of there is, uh, if you ever decide to uninstall it, a little more complicated, but again, not that difficult to do. So if uh, all of that seems a little challenging, I would just uh, suggest you go ahead and make yourself a live CD or DVD. Uh, most computers are set actually to boot from the optical drive, your CD, DVD drive first. So uh, make a CD, put it in there, run it live, and see whether you think uh, it's something you want to go further with. Uh, when you're running from a CD, it is slower uh, than it would be running either from a USB uh, thumb drive, if it's a current fast one, or certainly from uh, an installed version on your hard drive, uh, either or. But I would strongly suggest you start with uh, a live CD. And uh, how do you do that? You uh, go to the... Uh, Linux site that you want to try. If it has a live CD ISO file, download the ISO file. And then you're going to want to burn it to either a CD or a DVD. And the best burning software I have run into uh, is a program called CD Burner XP. I know XP, old, old. Yeah, it's old, but they keep updating it. Uh, it was updated this year. There have been 30 updates to it since uh, I first started using this thing. Uh, it does the best job of burning the ISO file of anything I've found. It's free. Uh, again, there's a link here to it. You can find it. And, uh, you're going to download it from File Hippo, one of my favorite places. Top window is what comes up uh, when you start the program. And this is what you want, burn ISO file. And the other thing that is, uh, when you go to burn it, you need to make sure that you do not close the disk. And that will allow you to save programs and data and whatever to the disk. And that's one of the options. And there are, uh, these are actually the options that uh, when you push on the uh, little gear button, you can see that there's lots of options to have. But when you click on this burn ISO, uh, the only thing that you need to make sure that is not checked is to close the disk. Okay, if you're going to put it on a uh, USB thumb drive, there are two programs that I'd recommend. Uh, this program, you download the ISO file. You also download this free universal USB installer uh, and just follow the program and it'll tell you uh, locate the file that you want to put on the thumb drive, the ISO file, what thumb drive you want to use, uh, how much persistence space you're going to leave, and that's space for uh, storing things. 
the limitation here is going to be four gigs uh, on the thumb drive because FAT32, which is the uh, file system you want to format this thing in, the largest file it'll deal with is uh, four gigs. So you don't have that limitation on a CD and uh, on your hard drive uh, you can have this stores everything as a file individual things in a large file. Uh, on the hard drive you can have several of those. So uh, if you're going to store a lot of stuff you probably uh, need to go beyond that. Or, not going to complicate this too much, there is a, a format for Linux that will allow you to do bigger files. This is the other uh, program to install a ISO on a USB thumb drive. Uh, this one works well with Mint. Um, that's how I put it on a thumb drive and it worked great. I'm just talking about storage a little bit. Uh, if you CD, DVD, make sure they're not finalized so you have open space to store things. On USB you're in FAT32 as opposed to uh, some of the newer file systems that allow files bigger than 4 gig. And then if you store it on a hard drive, it'll be in the uh, EXT4, which is a Linux format, and there's no limit on size. Okay, so what kind of programs are available for Linux? And there are bazillions of them. Uh, this particular thing here uh, is from Linux.com. And it goes into, it's got uh, 142 pages with 25 on each page, over 12,000 of these things. Uh, these will go on virtually almost any Linux uh, distribution. Cups, we're going to come back and talk about Cups. But there's a lot of programs here. Here, uh, they list uh, the newest, coolest ones. This is Wine that I talked to you about. And uh, it really, uh, once you understand it, uh, it really is not that difficult to deal with. Uh, it, again, it's free. And it basically will allow you to run any uh, Windows EXE program uh, on a Linux system. there's their downloads and this is a list of programs that they know for sure it will uh, work with there's 25 on a page and there are 494 pages of programs that they've checked running wine with so uh, should be enough to take care of most of your needs I would think and again, you can search for them by category, by license, by name, by however you want to search for them in Wine. So Cups, I mentioned Cups, and Cups is a program that uh, allows printers to run with Linux. And uh, this particular slide you're looking at here, I just chose Canon Bubble Jets because I did. These are the Bubble Jets that will work with the uh, Cups program in Linux uh, and there are a, a lot most but you can run into like I did uh, one of my printers is a uh, Epson Workforce 840 uh, pretty much a commercial printer and uh, they didn't it wasn't covered under cups so I went to Epson directly and asked for Linux drivers for that particular machine and it had uh, the complete set of drivers then it had just the generic driver it had a fax PC fax driver it had uh, scan drivers and so on everything that you would need so uh, typically it's it's not the problem that it once was getting a, a peripheral to run no more than Windows. Windows uh, today, sometimes what ran on 7 won't run on 8. So, anyhow, uh, a consideration you need to give, though, before you uh, 
start looking at using Linux full time. Security. You'll hear a lot of people say that Linux is much more secure than Windows and Mac, and they're 100% correct. But that doesn't mean that uh, it's 100% secure. Uh, there are always people looking to find a way to steal your things. So uh, there's a whole section here on how to secure your Linux installation, starting with uh, your router, so your eyes, ears to the outside world. This one says the 80 best Linux security applications, and that goes into things like KeyPass is included in there. So anyhow, it's a list of uh, programs that you might want to consider. Oops, and we went right past that. If you're really, really, really concerned about security, there's a Linux distribution called Tails. And this is uh, actually was developed for the government. Uh, it uses Tor networks, and uh, it, it really is pretty much state-of-the-art. Uh, so if uh, any of you are planning to do uh, illicit things, uh, or you just don't want anybody to know what you're doing, and uh, I can understand that. This is where you want to go, Tails. And uh, I just included this. Uh, almost all the major manufacturers do have uh, computers that they build that come with Linux rather than Windows or uh, Apple. Uh, this particular one, as you can see, is pretty high-end. Uh, it's an i7 notebook with uh, 8 gigs of uh, 1600 megahertz of RAM. Uh, big stuff. It sells for uh, I think around 1300 bucks, and they've got they've got several of them in the line. But uh, Linux is not that far out of mainstream. And I skipped right past the end of the show. Uh, going to be uh, showing movies at the presentation and uh, you'll find links to the uh, movies uh, on the forum. Thanks for watching. I hope that uh, you'll at least give Linux a try one of these days.